morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you to Speaker Emerita Pelosi, Ranking Member DeLauro for their partnership, and to our sister colleagues leading the Black Women and Girls Caucus, Representatives Watson Coleman, Kelly Clark, and Omar, and also Ranking Member Bobby Scott, who has been very supportive of this work. And thank you to our advocates uh, who make this moment possible. And uh, my thought partner and my teacher uh, in this work, Dr. Monique Kuvson, Fatima Goss Graves from the National Women's Law Center, and Rebecca Amadi of, of Gilson. The GAO report we are releasing today has been years in the making. Prior to my election to Congress, I served on the Boston City Council for eight years, where I first began the work of protecting the wellness of black and brown girls in our schools. There were a pair of girls in Massachusetts, Maya and Deanna Cook, who received detentions and suspensions for violating the school's dress code related to their protective hairstyle of extensions. They were scholars and athletes. They ran on the track team, so they wore their hair in a protective hairstyle, which is also why we need to pass the Crown Act federally <laughs> and ban race-based hair discrimination. Um, but that was what sent me on a journey uh, to uh, further understand uh, just how systemic uh, this crisis is. So those experiences uh, led me in 2017 to host uh, evidence-based focus groups in partnership with Dr. Monique Kuvson with girls of color in the Boston area. And those stories inform policies recommendations that we offer to improve school climate across Boston public schools. We convened 100 girls, 100 girls, experts in their lived experiences whose stories that we needed to hear and we held sacred space for those stories. We listened and we learned. And the overall message was the same. Feelings of unworthiness, being stereotyped, and experiences of being silenced and shamed. In 2017, I was a Boston City Councilor. In 2024, I'm a member of Congress and get to take those issues that I began working on in the micro level, on the municipal level, to now address at the macro level federally. I still carry those stories with me every day. Today we're here to shine a light on the push out crisis. This is a crisis of systemic criminalization and adultification that has caused black and brown girls to be disproportionately pushed out of our schools at alarming rates. I'm glad to be here with Dr. Kuvson, again, who educated me on this issue. She, she is a global leader um, who has used uh, data, uh, storytelling, her platforms, and the power of her literary pen uh, to shine a light on this crisis. We know that girls of color are more likely to be disciplined or suspended for arbitrary infractions like dress code violations. From natural hairstyles to body shaming, our girls are over-policed, under-protected, and too often pushed out of school and onto a pathway to confinement. The impact of these overly harsh practices come with real-world consequences. Black women and girls are now the fastest growing population in the U.S. criminal legal system and are far more likely to be disciplined and detained for less serious infractions than men. Black women are more likely to live in poverty, work in low-wage jobs, and still earn just 64 cents for every dollar earned by white men. And make no mistake, when we discipline and detain our girls, we fail to see their humanity, and we fail to see their brilliance. And we fail to see a future for them where they are free to live in their truths. I'm so grateful that every day I get to show up fully, authentically, and unapologetically as myself, without fear and without discrimination. And that is what every black girl deserves. Today, we are releasing the findings of a new study conducted by the Government Accountability Office into the disparate impact of school disciplinary policies on black and brown girls in K-12 public schools. This groundbreaking report, which was introduced at the request of Speaker Emerita Pelosi, 
Ranking Member DeLauro and myself is the first, the very first, to directly examine the underlying infraction data among discipline disparities and identify factors that contribute to them. The GAO's report was devastating, but unsurprising. It confirms much of what we already knew. Black girls face more and harsher forms of discipline compared to other girls, and the data is damning. Despite making up only 15% of all girls in public schools, black girls received nearly half of all suspensions and expulsions in the 2017 to 18 school year. Nationally, black girls are disciplined more than three times the rate of white girls. And in my home state of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, black girls were suspended at 4.2 rate, times the rate of their white peers. These disparities are further exacerbated for black girls with disabilities and black girls that are part of the LGBTQIA community. The GAO found that within the same schools, the GAO found that within the same schools, biases such as adultification and colorism contribute to the harsher discipline of black girls. And notably, the GAO found that across the United States, please understand this when we say it is systemic, across the United States, black girls receive harsher punishments than their white peers for similar behaviors. To put it simply, this damning new report affirms what we've known all along, that black girls continue to face a crisis of criminalization in our schools, and it provides powerful new data to push back on the harmful narrative that black girls are disciplined more because they misbehave more. Now, policy is my love language, and our girls are certainly in need of some love. And the only way that we can address this crisis is through intentional, trauma-informed policy. I hope this report and the alarming new data it contains will motivate Congress to advance legislation, including our Ending Push Out Act to address the discriminatory push out of black girls in schools. Our bill, which I'm proud to co-lead with Representatives Watson Coleman and Omar, would address this crisis head on by investing in safe and nurturing school environments. As Dr. Cookson has so often said, our girls need to know that they are loved and they are sacred. As Republicans in school districts nationwide promote policies that target and further marginalize our most vulnerable students, this is the type of trauma-informed, culturally sensitive policy we need in this moment. So Congress must act. This is a systemic crisis. It is essential. And our black girls deserve it. I'm grateful once again to the GAO for conducting this important study and to Speaker Emerita Pelosi, Ranking Member DeLauro, and our colleagues and advocates for their partnership. Action is essential for the safety and well-being and the peace for our black girls. I look forward to continuing our work together in building a just America where the push-out crisis is non-existent and where every student can thrive. And now I'm honored to turn it over to Speaker Emerita, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Presley, uh, for introducing us to this horrible situation for black girls in schools in America. We knew that justice needed to be done, but we did not ha know how fully. And now we have the documentation. Rosa and I, and when you want to get a GAO report to happen, you have to have a member of the leadership uh, or the chair of a committee of jurisdiction to sign it up. Congresswoman Presley had the idea, she had the vision, she had the approach, she had this plan and the rest. Thank you for inviting us to join you on this. And as you said, the challenge is so unfair to black girls in America. Uh, I did want to say <clears throat> that you said you hoped we would take up this bill. We have to make this a priority to take up the bill. That is absolutely necessary. So it's an honor to be here with Representative Presley, uh, with Rosa DeLauro, Madam Chair, to be again of the Appropriations Committee, with Dr. Kubson. Oh, thank you so much. I can't wait to read the book. And, and the Criminalization of Black Girls in School, in case you want to get that book, 
Bonnie and uh, Bonnie Coleman, uh, Congresswoman Coleman, Congresswoman Kelly, Congresswoman Omar, are all part of the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls. Uh, they are co-chairs, and thank you for your leadership in that regard. That brings us <clears throat> to where we are today. Blessed by Fatima Goss, Fatima Goss Groves, uh, Rebecca Amadi, and uh, as mentioned again, Dr. Clifton. So we look forward to hearing from you, but I just do want to take a moment again to thank uh, Congresswoman Presley for her leadership, for shining a vital spotlight on a tragic injustice in our schools that has been overlooked for too long. The groundbreaking GAO report that I was honored to join Congresswoman Presley in and Rosa DeLauro highlights the unacceptable, as she said, discrimination against that girl, black girls face K-12, K-12, we're talking about little girls, every day. <clears throat> the wildly disproportionate, disproportionate number of black girls who face harsher, more frequent discipline is really truly a challenge to the conscience of our country. I always like to say when people ask me what are the most important uh, issues facing our Congress, I always say the same thing, our children, our children, our children. That's all of our children. The health, their education, their economic security, the opportunity lost from these beautiful girls have so much, so much potential to amplify the stories of the girls and accelerate our community's response. Uh, just so you know, the Ending Push Out Act establishes new federal grants to support states and schools that commit to ban unfair discriminatory school discipline, protect civil rights data collection, strengthening the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, and establishes federal interagency task force to end the school push-out crisis and its impact on girls of color. Just, you'll be hearing that again and again. And there, there's more, uh, but it's, a, it's a, a just making a tremendous difference, which would not have happened without the, the roadmap that Congresswoman Presley gave us, shining the spotlight on the problem, giving us the sense 15 percent of the girls, black girls are the children in school, 50 percent of the push-outs. How could that possibly, how could that possibly be right? Well, it isn't. We know it isn't. And we're all going to be uh, very eager and lining up to, to sign on to Congresswoman Presley's bill. With that, I'm pleased to yield back, or do I give the chair to <laughs> Madam Ranking Member of the Excellent. Appropriations <laughs> Committee, a champion on these issues every minute of every day, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, really, it's what it what it. It's really an honor to be here today, and I too, want, I want to say thank you to all of you and, uh, you know, recognize all of the the extraordinary uh, women who uh, who stand behind me. But uh, first and foremost, to say a thank you to Congresswoman Presley uh, for her vision, uh, for her uh, commitment, and her. Uh, not, just, not only compassion, but passion on this issue and getting something done. And being able to join uh, with Congresswoman Presley and with Speaker Emerita Pelosi, uh, who is at, at her core, it's children, 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 and all of our children, um, uh, and, and to join in, in asking for this GAO study. And then standing with uh, just unbelievable champions in this area, Congresswoman Watson Coleman, Congresswoman uh, Ilhan Omar and Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, and the focus on ensuring, ensuring that black and brown girls receive fair and equitable treatment in our nation's schools. And to our advocates, uh, Dr. Kufson, uh, our champion always is uh, Fatima uh, uh, Goss Graves um, and, and, and Rebecca. What, what you have helped us to do with this, this uh, 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 GAO study, this report, is you, you give life to the uh, legislation that we can move. And we're not standing on, you, you, you know, uh, just on wet ground or no ground or so forth, but on data and right. science and so forth, which gives us a strength and leverage uh, to move forward. And it is further evidence for what we have known for some time. Uh, that girls of color receive more frequent, more severe discipline in schools than other girls. Disproportionate use of exclusionary, what is that? Suspensions. 
Expulsion. That's what exclusionary. It's a nice word, but it's you know it's it's it's, it's the result of this. Um, and what happens is this is so damaging to the safety, to the well-being, and to the academic success. What, right. One of the facts is data shows that in every state, every single state in this nation, black girls are disciplined at higher rates. With a uh, and those with disability as Congresswoman Presley pointed out, exclusionary discipline rates in black girls grew larger, if you can imagine that. You talked about 15% of girls in public schools uh, uh, received half of all the suspensions um, and in, at to, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, you know, education has always been the route to success in this nation. And if you go to really discriminate against students in this way. You know, and kids are only uh, going to learn if they're allowed to participate in school and to reach their full potential. And this is what is really thwarting that full potential. We cannot have an education system that tolerates disciplining one group of students differently and more severely than another. Uh, as a ranking member of the House Appropriations Committee and on the Education uh, Subcommittee, we, I want to make an assurance here that we're, this report, as I said, based on science, helps us to move forward, to be in touch with the Department of Education and ensuring that the Department of Education is doing all that they can to protect students' civil rights and to improve the well-being of our nation's uh, 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 children. And, and this has allowed us to move forward on legislation, like the push-out piece, which we can focus on. Schools across the country and policymakers at every level of government should take these critical findings into account, examine that use of exclusionary discipline policies disproportionately harming black and brown girls. Nothing, nothing is as important as ensuring the health, safety, and education of young people in this country. It is, education is that prerequisite for realizing our dreams. Education levels the playing field for children of all backgrounds. We cannot let unfair disciplinary practices stand in the way of our children's dreams. I might, I, I, I thought that this was an unbelievable finding here. More, this is about nationally black girls had the lowest perceptions of safety and connectedness at school. More black girls disagreed that teachers treated students with respect compared to white girls. And over 300,000 girls overall believed there was no teacher or adult at school who genuinely cared about them. I mean, my God, what a sense of being disconnected from your, your avenue, your pathway to success. Thank you. Thank you again to Congresswoman uh, Presley. Thank you always to Speaker Emerita Pelosi for her, her commitment uh, to children in this country. I'm honored to be with you this morning. Thanks so very, very much. Where are you, Diane? Okay, you're on. I don't want to apologize for being emotional because um, this is a part of the problem is that our black girls are talked out of their feelings and out of sitting in them and having them acknowledged and validated and um, To be a black girl is a very um, cruel dichotomy. You are in some ways hyper visible, which is why you are profiled and criminalized and um, surveyed, but you are also hyper invisible and your pain um, delegitimized. And so the reason why I'm emotional is because one, I'm encouraged, I'm hopeful, and I'm so uh, overwhelmed by the support of my colleagues. But most of all, I just want every black girl to know that we have not forgotten about them and that we see them. With that, um, I want to bring uh, Dr. Monique Coopson to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, 
Congresswoman Presley. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to join in this important conversation about the specific ways that too many of our girls are experiencing their educational environments. I'm Dr. Monique Cousin. I am the founder of the National Black Women's Justice Institute and the president and CEO of Grantmakers for Girls of Color, a premier philanthropic intermediary that resources girls and gender expansive youth of color in the US and beyond. I wrote Push Out, the criminalization of black girls in schools almost 10 years ago. And I wrote it to examine what I call school to confinement pathways, the policies, practices, conditions, and the prevailing consciousness. So what we think about and implicitly believe about the intersecting identities of these young people that render them vulnerable to future contact with the juvenile court and criminal legal system. This GAO report is important. It is not surprising. It is devastating in many ways, and it confirms what we have known, that black girls are overrepresented across the spectrum of school discipline at every educational level. I, along with other scholars in this work, have demonstrated that there are many factors contributing to push out, but that among them and at the center of the issues are, one, the policies that criminalize normal adolescent behavior and that develop an infrastructure, including instruments of, of surveillance, what I call instruments of surveillance and law enforcement, to sustain long-held entrenched biases, stereotypes and tropes uh, that, particularly about black girls, which lead to our diminished capacity to respond appropriately to students, our children, with care when they are disrupted and therefore disruptive in schools. The second issue is adultification. It's adultification bias um, specifically, which prevents adults from recognizing their trauma and strips them of being able to be seen as worthy of empathy, comfort, and protection. And this impacts language and decision making in matters as specific as incident reports and as broad as district-wide codes of conduct. G4GC continues to support organizations like Love Your Magic in Boston, A Long Walk Home in Chicago, Every Black Girl in South Carolina, and the organization Justice for Black Girls, which works uh, nationwide, along with hundreds of other organizations that are actively working to respond to root causes associated with push out and to co-construct the liberated futures that our black girls and gender expansive youth deserve. The National Black Women's Justice Institute recently launched a data hub at nbwji.org, which is accessible to anyone to review their state's discipline data trends, because we monitor what's important to us. And we will, you will all find, as has already been shared, that every state has a push out problem. As a former educator, and principal investigator of, inve of evaluations for school-based programs, I know that the safest schools are those that operate with the belief that no child is disposable, and that demonstrate this by building an infrastructure, including counselors and restorative approaches to respond to children appropriately when they experience dysregulation. And because we know that, it's not enough to map disparity and then resolve to do nothing about it. I have recommended for schools to be locations for healing so that they can realize their potential as locations for learning, for black girls, and for everyone else. I have personally supported the Ending Push Out Act since 2019 when it was first introduced, and I continue to professionally endorse it as it aligns with many of the research-based best practices that counter or that are associated with creating schools that counter bias and instead provide a foundation for our young people to be in right relationship with their teachers, with their peers, and with themselves. When schools are part of the tapestry of healing in the lives of our children, they feel safe enough to learn, and they grow to become well-adjusted adults who walk in their purpose and who live with integrity. Thank you all for this opportunity to share these comments. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Right now, we'll hear from Congresswoman Robin Kelly. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
I, I'm known as a crybaby in Congress, so uh, <laughs> Congressman Presley has me going. But oftentimes you hear that the Congressional Black Caucus is the conscience of the Congress, and I always look at Congresswoman Presley as the conscience of the caucus because of what the, her vision, what she works on, her leadership, and uh, you are just so appreciated more than you know. I'm also honored to be here with, uh, you just speak to me, speaker, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Chairperson Deloro, my, my colleague in the Congressional Black Caucus, oh, not the, the Caucus on Black Women and Girls, Bonnie Watson Coleman, and my colleague Ilhan, and all the advocates for everything that you've done. Um, we all know that black girls face discrimination in school and, ho and, and they're being held back from succeeding. And you've heard all the stats and all of that. I won't you know, go over that again, but thanks to my colleague, uh, Watson Coleman, I recently spoke in New Jersey uh, at a conference for black girls in middle school and high school, and I told them that they should always try, even if there's a chance of failing, but it becomes immeasurably more difficult to try and succeed if the system is rigged. It becomes so much harder for black girls to achieve higher grades, concentrate in class, make school friends, when they are constantly pulled out of class for the same actions as their white peers. And what is the effect? Black girls don't feel safe at school. They avoid areas in fear of being attacked. Their teachers don't respect them, as you've heard. And all of that is internalized. Black girls don't need to be told these numbers and statistics. They are living these experiences. And I know we're talking about school, but I do an immense amount of work around black mater maternal mor mortality and morbidity. And the thing is, you know, it starts so young that we're not listened to and we're not worth it and we're not valued. And we carry that into our adult life. And that's why too many of us are dying from black um, maternal mortality and morbidity. And the last thing I'll say, when my daughter was two or three, she's ve she was very tall for her age and uh, she's much darker than me. And I know, I saw the things that my daughter went through like people would ask her questions and because of her young age, she didn't really know the answer, but people just thought she was older and the pressure that that put on her and what that did to her feelings and sometimes her self-worth. And I used to always have to jump in like, she's only two, you know, she's only this, you know, she doesn't know that. So I just wanna thank everybody for their work. We all must read the report. Ayana put me on as one of your sponsors and thank all of you so much because you are the wind beneath our wings. That's how we can get the things done that we do. So thank you. And, and with that, <laughs> Fatima Goss Graves for her your remarks. Oh. Uh, good morning. My name is Fatima Goss Graves. I'm president and CEO at the National Women's Law Center. And really thank you Representative Presley, for your leadership on this issue and your continued uh, partnership to ensure that black girls can learn in spaces where they are safe and supported and affirmed. And I'm so grateful, Speaker Merida, to Ranking Member DeLauro. Uh, and you are right, you always put children and families first. Um, it has been uh, the, the sort of calling <laughs> uh, for so many of us, but uh, too often people forget about black girls. And so I am so glad that we have this leadership here today. And um, to the leaders of the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls, what a time to have that, yes. uh, uh, yes. that leadership. And it gives me more confidence to know that you're determined to put the experiences that black girls have in school for it, but that black women have in life and, uh, and be the conscious for us all. So thank you so much. Um, you know, I think that no one would disagree that all of our children deserve to learn in environments where they feel safe, where they feel supported, where they are affirmed. So black girls are no different. But the GAO report said what we knew, what we felt, what the data has been showing, that black girls are being harshly di disciplined in school and that they're losing learning time and bonding time because of it. 
and that they're punished for behaviors that are considered totally typical children and teen behaviors, and that they are seen inherently as older, carrying the weight of other people's racial and gender stereotypes. And what happens is that their lights are routinely and systemically dimmed at early, early ages. We know that they're not being punished, as you said, because they're more likely to misbehave. That is not the case. In fact, the report also found that the discipline gap between black girls and white girls is primarily due to differences in how they are disciplined within the same school. So it is not even that some schools are very harsh and some schools are very least are very loose. These aren't problems that just rain from the sky. They're an outgrowth of the unmet needs. They are an outgrowth of the inability to support students with disabilities, of ignoring trauma, and ensuring that the staff, the adults who work in those buildings do not unfairly stereotype black girls. And the consequences are felt in real time, of course, but I want to name a fact that sort of stunned me and I went back and I was like, is this right? Because they're felt over a lifetime. So the difference between getting pushed out of school, not finishing high school, uh, not completing college has giant economic consequences for black women, for their families, for communities. This statistic sticks with me. The lifetime difference in earnings between a black woman without a high school diploma and one who's able to attain a bachelor's degree, it is $1.2 million. So the Ending Push Out Act would set us up to address the crisis with the urgency that this problem deserves and with the transparency that we need to hold us all accountable to the well-being of black girls. So I hope this report is the boost that we need to push Congress to advance the Ending Push Out Act and to remind us all of our collective obligation to create safe, supporting, and affirming learning environments where all students, but especially black girls, can thrive. Thank you. And, oh, to Representative Watson Coleman, is that <laughs> So, first of all, I feel honored and blessed to be an original co signer of, of this bill, the Push Out Bill, and to work with Ayana um, on something that's just so vitally important to even my granddaughter, who is 11 years old right now, uh, to have the speaker here, speaker, your speaker, <laughs> and, the, and the soon to be chair of the Appropriations Committee is so vitally important to us because uh, if they say so, we move forward in a way that we might not otherwise get to move. To our scholars and our advocates, couldn't do it without you. So let me just say, because there's nothing in here that you haven't already heard. A couple of takeaways. We knew how bad it was. We collected anecdotes, but now we got facts. Mm -hmm. We got facts that have come about because of some serious research which was done. And these facts reveal that little black girls, little brown girls, even little dark-skinned girls are treated differently than little lighter-skinned of uh, black girls are in school not feeling loved, not feeling encouraged, not feeling that there's any expectation of their having um, a, a successful future. They are treated as if they don't have worth. And the consequences of those actions at very young age, because this bill covers K through 12, hear me, K through 12, so even our youngest are experiencing different treatment in school than they should. It means that we have so much work to do. For the GAO to come to the conclusions that it came to validates the fact that we got a serious problem. Now, we're right now in a period of otherness. And if you're not right. white, male, and wealthy, you're an other. And you're not treated with, but I can handle that. My 11-year-old granddaughter can't understand that. 
And so it is important that we have a Congress and a White House that will understand the importance of putting money, resources, into not only providing the uplifting of our girls in school, but teaching teachers and administrators and the nurses and the resource officers that are there to look very closely in your heart and determine what it is that you are seeing. Because our young girls have the right to the same humanity as anybody else. And until we can get them there, that they can walk in their schools proudly holding their heads up with whatever their crown looks like right. and feeling that they are equal on all levels, we've got serious work to do. Because at the end of the day, whether those who perpetuate this otherness recognize it or not, those girls in those schools represent the future of this country. Yes. So you need to know how you want to be treated and respected. So I thank you, Ayana, for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I thank our leadership for being so committed to this and our advocates and our scholars for fighting the good fight for so long because our girls deserve it right. and nothing less. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know who's there. Okay. <laughs> Congresswoman Watson Coleman, the microphone is always on. Uh, we thank you for your leadership and your commitment. Um, and now we'll hear from Rebecca Amity. Thank you all. I'm deeply honored to be here. My name is Rebecca Amadi, and I'm speaking on behalf of GLSEN, a national network of students, educators, Sorry, Mr. Pulitzer. Oh, okay. it's okay. <laughs> um, a national network of students, educators, parents, and community allies working to stop bullying and harassment for LGBTQI plus youth. All students deserve safe and welcoming learning environments, but for too long, certain groups have been pushed out to the margins and denied equal access to educational opportunities. The recent GAO report confirms what we've known for decades. Black girls are disproportionately experiencing exclusionary school discipline policies, and this negatively impacts their ability to learn and thrive at school. GLSEN has worked with educators, parents, and youth for over 30 years to ensure schools are affirming places for all students. We know that black, indigenous, and other students of color cannot separate their sexual orientation or gender identity from other parts of who they are. In 2022, GLSEN's National School Climate Survey found that 40% of LGBTQI plus students of color reported victimization on both sexual orientation and race. Students who experience bullying or harassment are more likely to report lower GPAs, lower self-esteem, higher levels of depression, and higher rates of school discipline. When victimized students are more likely to be disciplined than receive the care they need, you know our collective priorities are misplaced. We need comprehensive solutions that provide remedies for students facing disparate treatment hold school districts accountable, and build more just learning environments for all students. We are encouraged that the Senate included additional funding for the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights in this year's funding bill, which would expand the capacity to investigate incidents and patterns of discrimination in school districts across the country. The additional funding is a necessary step in tackling the disparities faced by LGBTQI plus students of color, but it's only a first step. We are proud to stand with Representative Presley and the distinguished leaders today to call for the passage of the Ending Push Out Act, which would invest significantly greater funding in the Office of Civil Rights to address the persistent and systematic failings that harm black girls, girls of color, and LGBTQI students of color. 
Creating and firming environments requires schools to retool their approach at, to discipline and incorporate inclusive trauma-informed standards. Black girls, girls of color, LGBTQI plus students, students with disabilities, and the students who stand at the nexus of those identities deserve schools that work for them, not against them. Thank you to all of those here with us today for your leadership on this issue and on behalf of LGBTQI plus students of colors and girls of color and black girls everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> Now we're here from my, my classmate uh, and a dear sister in service who was long led on issues of education, um, equity, and other issues of consequence, Representative Ilhan Omar. I want to thank um, Fatima, Rebecca, and Monique uh, for their, their advocacy. Really grateful to be here with Speaker Pelosi. Um, uh, Chairwoman uh, Deloro, um, our uh, distinguished um, Congresswoman from Jersey, Watsman Coleman, um, uh, Robin Kelly, uh, and uh, certainly um, my sister in service, Ayanna Presley. I stand here today not only as a black woman, but as a mother of black daughters. The report we are discussing today is a reflection of the America my daughters and millions of black girls across this nation navigate every single day. The Government Accountability Office has shared a truth we have known in our communities for far too long. Our schools are failing our black girls. They are pushing them out, criminalizing their behavior, and robbing them of their right to an equal education. In every single state, black girls fa face harsher discipline than their white peers. Colorism, adultification, stereotypes, these biases are weaponized against our black girls, stripping away their innocence and their right to learn. In my home state of Minnesota, black students make up only 18% of the student body, yet they experience 54% of all suspensions and expulsions. That's why last year I was honored to join my colleagues, Representatives Ayanna Presley and Bonnie Watsman Coleman to reintroduce the Ending Push Out Act. We demand a future where every girl, regardless of the color of her skin, can walk into a classroom and feel safe, valued, and empowered. To every, every black girl, who has been sent home because of her hair, who has been labeled defiant for speaking her mind, who has been made to feel less than, I see you, we see you. I was you, I am fighting for you, and I will not rest until every single girl in this country has the opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive without fear of being punished. The time of change isn't coming, it is here and we are here to bring it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes.